Hello everyone, we're reading from Murder in the Kolo. We're going to read the last chapter in the epilogue from Murder in the Kolo, chapter 25, all gone. It took a while to get through the traffic snarls near Daphna's house, and when we got about a block away, we found the area cordoned off. Police, fire and rescue, and medical teams were spread out on the street and on the adjacent lawns. The firemen were dousing water on the burning remnants of Daphna's house. Surprisingly, all the initial 100-foot fireball, surprisingly, after the initial 100-foot fireball, the flames died rapidly, most likely due to dispersal of the propane gas. Looks like the tank had almost been empty after all. Most of Daphna's house was just not there. All in all, it could have been much worse. People with cuts from flying glass were being treated by the busy medics. The surrounding trees had singed foliage, but they all looked like they would live. The homes facing the blast had their windows punched in. None of the surrounding buildings had caught fire, but a few would need paint jobs. Fire and rescue would not let anyone near the burning building, so I could not get information about the survivors from Daphna's house. TV and radio crews had set up their broadcast trucks, and the reporters were walking about interviewing all the neighbors. Each, th each station was giving exclusive coverage of all the latest information concerning the blast. As usual, no one had a clue. One of the medics saw my blood-soaked shirt and the bandage on my head and hustled me over to his ambulance. I might as well get treated while I waited. I was consumed with concern. She could not be hurt. It was unthinkable. The medic carefully removed my bandage and to make conversation asked me, where were you when this happened? About three miles from here, I said honestly, my, my eyes riveting, riveted on the firemen as they worked. When the bandage came off, the MT seemed to know that he was dealing with a gunshot wound. Uh, how did you get this wound? Gunshot, probably a 22, but it could have been a 25 caliber. I'm not sure, I answered honestly. The tech put a clean bandage on my head and made me hold it in place with my hand. Now hold that, uh, I'll be right back. After about five minutes, uh, I can't be sure because all my attention was on Daphna's house. I heard Slattery's gruff voice. I should have known it was you. You're just like a bad penny. At, at least you weren't in the house. Good to see you too, I said sarcastically. It was the best I could do to try and lighten the dark, depressed mood I was in. Who shot you? He asked. I'll tell you when I know what happened in that explosion, I told him as I, st as I stared straight ahead. If your gunshot has anything to do with the Klein murder, you've got to tell me. You're withholding evidence, he warned me. Believe me, whether you know or you don't who shot me, it's not going to make a big difference in this case, I said confidently. You also got to go to a hospital. A gunshot wound to the head is no joke, he emphasized. Do I look like I'm laughing? I'll go to the medical center once and know what happened to the Lachler family, I said grimly. You mean once you know what happened to Mrs. Lachler, he said knowingly. I thought about what they just said and then nodded. Yeah, I guess so. I had no idea if the vault had enough air to sustain four people for over an hour. Nor did I know if the concrete walls would sustain the force of the initial blast. So many unknowns. I could only hope. Finally, the firemen declared the, f declared the fire out and would allow the rescue teams to approach. Slatterly somehow commandeered a fire and rescue overcoat and helmet for me, and I was able to get near the remains of the building. The captain of the crew was telling his men that it was unlikely there were any survivors, but instructed them to go through the wreckage to retrieve bodies if there were any. You've got to, you have got to be wrong. I had an advantage that they did not that they did not have. I knew where the vault was located in all that wreckage. The blast had thrown up most of what had been just above the propane tank, so that meant the area in front of the door was relatively clear. There was still the breeze covering the vault door, so no one had seen it yet, but I knew it was there. The problem was how to get down into the basement since the stairs had been blown to kingdom come. I saw a fireman with a ladder and I grabbed it from his arms. Before he could protest too loudly, I got it set firmly on the basement floor and was scampering down. Grabbing at the breeze and burned wood, I tried to clear the way to the door, 
but my ribs were hurting like the dickens and I was not very effective. Somebody help me, I shouted. People saw what I was doing and within moments half a dozen firemen were at my side moving the smoldering remains that were in front of the door. Another dozen were standing above as the basement wall offered, uh, on the basement wall offering suggestions as we worked. Once the door was cleared, enough for it to be open, I rapped loudly on the door, but I was not sure if that anyone could hear us. The door opened a crack and then we helped to swing it open further. Daphna stood at the door with a mother and two daughters. I had never been so happy to see anyone in my life. The Lachla family, none the worse for wear, stood mesmerized as they looked at the soot-covered apparition standing outside the vault door. Then Daphna stepped forward, stared wide-eyed at the destruction and at the debris. What happened to my hose? It's just doing, undergoing a little remodeling, I said facetiously. A little remodeling? My toes, it's not here, she said. Then she understood the gravity of the situation and she became frightened. Oh my God. Then she began to cry. It's okay, you're safe now. We've got you, I said emotionally. Maybe I was crying as well. A few things happened at the same time. Cheers broke out from the firemen and security people. The news broadcasters told the world of the miraculous rescue of the Lachla family, and I took Daphna in my embrace. I, of course, knew that a yeshiva bacha was not supposed to do things like that, but Daphna also knew about that rule, and she did not seem to mind. Whatever the reason, even with my aching ribs getting crushed, it felt good. She held me, and I held her. There was a transfer of unspoken emotion that was indescribable. I am sure that some of the cameramen got video of me hugging her for the second time in 24 hours, and very likely we would become national celebrities. But considering that most of the people in the yeshiva world did not watch TV, who cares? Tuchus kicking partners should be allowed to hug. We were helped up the ladder and out of the basement. The medics checked out the Lachla family for smoke inhalation or any possible injury, and they were found to be perfectly healthy. Once it was determined that there was no one else in the house, the fire and rescue teams began folding up all their equipment. The police were running crime scene tape around the property, and the TV crews were departing, and the numbers of gawkers were diminishing rapidly. Slatterly Karov and asked, you ready now? Yeah, it's time. I said, returning my coat and helmet to the fireman. Daphna saw my bandage. What happened to you? That's what I wanted, know, said the cop. I looked at them both and said accusingly, Revitz and Dvorah Klein. Daphna became very angry. I'll kill that bitch. Then, re then realizing what she just said, uh, please excuse me for using that word. Slatterly seemed amused and I said, you're excused and the word fits perfectly. The cop asked, so she's the one who killed the rabbi? Yep, I said with a nod. And you have proof, he asked, murder weapon and everything. And she shot you, said, asked the cop. Twice, I stated. She shot you, asked Daphna incredulously. I'm fine, I said, belitt belittling my injuries. Where else were you hit, she wanted to know. I pulled my sitter from my pants pocket and showed, her, showed them the slug lodged in the prayer book. Slavery moved away angrily and said, I'm going to get, I'm going to get an arrest warrant and find that, you'll excuse the expression, bitch. No need, I said. Do you have your car near here? Mrs. Caitlin had already taken over the care of her granddaughters and they went with Rebitz and Lipsky to her home. We rode over to the Klein house in Slatterly's car. I haven't got a search warrant, stated the cop. I don't want her to get off on a technicality. I can't go in there. I'm almost certain you won't need it, I said to Sl I told Slatterly. But to be safe, you stay outside for five minutes after we get in. If I don't come out to warn you, you can come in. Will I need a backup, he asked. I doubt it was my answer. Daphna and I went up to the front door and rang the bell. We waited for about two minutes, but no one came to the door. How will we get in, asked Daphna. Most probably the door is not locked, I said, pointing to the door. Daphna turned the handle and the door opened. How did you know? I know, Devorah Klein. I know what she would do, I said sadly. Where is she, asked Daphna. Follow me, was all I said, and I headed for the steps down to the basement. As I expected, the late Rebitz and Devorah Klein was swaying back and forth ever so gently, 
suspended from the rope that was tied around her neck. Dafna retreated a step, brought her hands up to her mouth and said, Oh my God. There was a piece of rope tied around the dress just below her knees. She had to be modest until the last. There was a plastic sheet spread on the floor beneath her body with a small puddle of urine in its center. I pointed at the sheet. That's where the puddle of pee went. When she killed her husband, she put the plastic sheet under the body. Where did she kill him? In his bed, I suspect. She slid him along the floor with another plastic sheet. It slides pretty well over the carpeting. Getting down the stairs was the tough part, and that was the reason for the injury to his heels. She hauled him up with a little block and tackle and then put on the noose. How did she have the strength to choke him? She's a little woman, declared Daphna. She designed an ingenious contraption for that. I'll show it to you someday. If she killed him in his bed, there must have been some sign of struggle, she argued. There probably was, I, get, I agreed. So why didn't the police see it, she wanted to know. Because Robinson Klein remade the bed and covered any signs that might have been there, I explained. Next day, she simply changed the bedding and it was all washed away. Would you look for signs of a struggle in a perfectly made bed? No, she admitted. Neither did the police. But why did she kill herself now, asked Dufna. The TV station had been broadcasting nonstop from your house. She probably fo followed what was happening on her computer. When she saw that she had not been successful in killing you, she had no other option, I answered. I heard Slattery come down the steps. He took one look at the body and said, holy crap. You don't need backup. You need the coroner, I told the cop. Slattery called the staff and they called the county coroner. When, when he was finished, he said, there is a note over here. We stepped over to a small table and there was a single sheet of paper covered with the Rabbitsons' perfect penmanship. The note said, I thought I could go on without my husband, but I was mistaken. May Hashem forgive me for what I have done. Dafna nodded her head as if realizing something for the first time. Did you notice that she never lied? Every time we spoke with her, she never lied. She just bent the truth, even in her last message in this world. She did not lie. She was insane, I said. As long as she did not utter an untruth, she thought that it was perfectly all right. She could bend the truth and omit the truth, and she was convinced that she was not lying. She did the most despicable things, but in her mind she thought that what she did was absolutely reasonable. That's what it said in Dr. Felix's file, she said. Who is Dr. Felix? asked laterally. We'll show you that later, I said to the cop. Then I turned to Daphna. Why were they going to the shrink? The doctor's notes say that Devorah had been mentally, mentally ill since childhood. She had even been hospitalized in her youth. She hid the fact that she was on medication and everything else from, from Avraham Klein before the marriage. After they were married, she tried to use her OCD to be the most perfect of Rebitsons. That's exactly what she said to me, I said in agreement. Do you know that they have never had kids? You know why they never had kids? Daphne asked. When I shook my head, she continued, because they never had relations. Nothing. What kind of a man was the rabbi? Why didn't he divorce her? I mean, 20 years. Holy cow, said the cop. Because Rabbi Klein realized that she would not be able to live with being a divorced Rebbitzin. It would not go over well in the community. It was not suitable for her, so he went with her for treatments in the hope of making her better. He did not want to shame her by making, by making any of her problems public. But 20 years? That's, 20, that's unbelievable. Rabbi Klein was a special person, said Daphna sadly. I continue with, I suspect everything came to her head after a escapade at the Hillel house. She told me he wanted her to be hospitalized or he was going to, to divorce her. Both options were unacceptable to her. Better to be the widow of a rabbi that committed suicide. Is she also the one who planted the grenade and got those Arabs to come to kill you? Asked laterally. That was her, I said. But I was not the target. She wanted to kill Daphna. Me? exclaimed Daphna. Why me? Because she did not want anyone to see Dr. Felix's files. You were a threat to her, I explained. Slatterly said, once the others get here, I'm going to make... I'm going, to, I'm going to take you to the medical center. What are you going to do about, well, about this? Daphne asked both of us. 
About what? asked the cop. We three know that Dora Klein killed her husband, she said. But we also know that she was totally crazy. I'm no lawyer, but it sounds to me that if she ever stood trial, she would probably be found not guilty by reason of insanity. Possibly, said Slatterly. Probably, I said. Now I know that you both want to uphold truth, justice, and the American way. You want to make criminals pay for their crimes, she said, taking a pause. But, and I ask you to hear me out, what good will it do to tell the world that the Klein was a murderess? Why can't we just let everyone think she took her own life because she was depressed by her husband's death? Because she was not depressed. She carefully planned the whole thing, and that makes it premeditated med murder. She has to pay, said the cop. But why, I asked, realizing what the Fanau was saying. She's not going to pay. She's dead. There is no insurance money or inheritance that is going to be scammed or anything. Letting the world know that this happened won't prevent another person from committing a similar crime. She was crazy. I even have a feeling that your police chief won't allocate the funds or manpower to conduct a full investigation because what does society gain by making all this public? Rabbi Klein lost his life because he did not want to embarrass his wife. If we make all this public, in a sense, we will be demeaning the great sacrifice he made. It's the law, said Slatterly defensively. And the law is a crack sometimes, I said. Haven't you ever worked on a case, caught the slime ball that did the crime, then they, and seen him walk because of a loophole in the law? We could hear the police crews entering the house. I'll have to think about that, said the, to the cop. Temporarily, I'm calling this a suicide. Now let's get you to the hospital. Slatterly offered to take Daphna to the Lipsky house, but she insisted she wanted to stay with me. I was x-rayed, had a CT scan, was poked and prodded, and the doctor said that I had a hairline fracture in my skull. Good thing I have always been thick-headed. There were two broken ribs on the left side of my chest and the beginning of a huge black and blue mark that went right down to my belly button. One of the ER, ER docs stitched the gap on the right side of my scalp and told me I would have an interesting scar when I started to go bald. Since my blood pressure and pulse were almost normal, they decided that I did not need to get a blood transfusion to get my blood count back to normal. Good food, rest, and relaxation would do just as well. In the end, I was connected to an IV and kept for the night because I had been knocked out by the head injury and the victims of the hospital and ins the hospital's insurance policy said that I was not allowed to be discharged directly. When I insisted that I was fine and that Daphna should go home to be with her daughter, she said, I haven't got a home anymore. Might as well spend the night here. The effects of the concussion were such that I dozed most of the time, but whenever I opened my eyes, it was comforting to see Daphna sitting there. Morning arrived in the East Lansing, and without my talus and tefillin, I would have to say my prayers without them. But at 7.30 a.m., Slatterly showed up and solved the problem because the state police had returned the items from my blown-up car the evening before. The picnic camper was in pieces, but the towels and filler were fine. The doctors discharged me and the nurse's aide put me on a wheelchair and conveyed me to the entrance. Another hospital dictum. Throughout it all, Daphna had been at my side. Well, maybe not all the time because her car, with a few scorch marks on the paint, was sitting in the parking structure. She must have gone to get it. So, okay, she had been there most of the time. I found that I liked that very much. I was helped into her car, and as we drove away from the hospital, I asked, What are you going to do now? I'm going to take you to her hotel for now, she said. After you drop me off? You mean without a roof over our heads? She asked. Typical Jewish answer, ask another question. Yeah, your house is gone. Well, because of the vault, my business is still intact, so that won't be a problem, she stated. I'll be able to be back in business without too much of a problem. I realized this morning that today is Friday and that we have no place to be for Shabbos. But then Rebbitz and Klein called and invited us to spend Shabbos with them. So we're going to go to Detroit as soon as I drop you off. We'll move into our house in Detroit for now. After all, it's just sitting there empty. Hopefully we'll get settled in by 2 o'clock and then that should give us enough time to rush to the mall to get clothes before sunset and the start of Shabbos. All our belongings and stuff were either burned or blown up. I just realized that I was, that it was indeed Friday morning. And since I had not been in the base Mendish, 
I had not received the Shabbos invitation from, my, from any of the rabbis or the married Bachrim. I had to get back to the city and scrounge some food for Shabbos. No more meals for Mrs. Kalin. No more Dafna. That will be strange. I really like seeing her and having her near me. The excitement of these past few days should last her a lifetime, so that she she would now re, she could now retire from her lustrous career as a detective and get back to her business and family. Looks like I'll have to just file this whole week to the pleasant memories file at the back of my brain. She has to get her life back on track. Interesting, she'll be in Detroit this weekend. So you'll be spending some time in Detroit, I stated. I really should have moved back when David died. I was just procrastinating. Aliza and Susie really should be at the girls' school in Detroit. I understood her immediately. You did not want to give up his memory. Too many good things associated with the house. Nothing so noble, she admitted. I was just hiding out here. Before David died, he made me promise that I would leave East Lansing and start a new life. I was just scared. Do you think you're ready now? I asked tentatively. She kept her gaze out the windshield as she drove and said, yes, things have changed. I'm ready now. How have they changed? I probed. Definitely for the better, she said. So are there good things in your life now? I questioned. Really good things, she said with a sly smile, keeping her eyes fixed straight ahead. Where's your house in Detroit? About four blocks from your condo, she said blandly. Whammy. Of course, she knew where I lived. She hacked my personal files. The idea that she would be living near me made me feel good. It put a new perspective on my future. That's really good because you promised to cook me dinner, so that will be really convenient. She still did not look in my direction, but said with a smile, yeah, really convenient. End of chapter 25. The epilogue. I checked out of the motel and took my bags down to the Hyundai. It had been towed and was now equipped with two new tires. As I put my bags into the back seat, I reflected over the Rabbi Klein case. Slatterly had consulted with his boss and it was decided that Rabbi Klein's death would be classified as a homicide with assailant unknown and officially the case was closed. Reverend Klein was classified as a suicide, which it was, and there will be no further investigation into her connection with the death of her husband. No one had decided what to do with the booby trapping of my car or instigating the GS attack or blowing up Daphna's house. But for now, there would be, not be an active investigation. It was now almost noon and I knew that Robinson Klein's funeral had taken place in Detroit earlier this morning. She would be buried next to her beloved husband. So the whole affair was now officially behind us. Since we parted this morning, Daphna has called me two times, supposedly about the return of her husband's tefillin and about Rebinson's, uh, the Rebinson's burial arrangements, but we both knew different. Now she was on her way to Detroit. The good thing about having your house blown up into tiny pieces was that you, you did not have to pack much. I was going around dressed only in a white shirt and a yarmulke because my yeshiva bucket uniform had been ruined by Revinson Klein when she made me the target of her shooting escapade. My spare outfits were in Detroit. The case was over and I took satisfaction in having solved it. I missed that feeling. We have to see how I could combine detective work with learning in the base medrash. Just as I hit the ignition and the small motor chugged into life, my car phone rang. I was surprised to hear Rav Kamanovitz's voice. Rev Shimon, how are you feeling? Fine, Rebbe, thank you for asking. No, I must be the one to thank you, uh, he said. I ask you to prove that Rabbi Avraham did not take his own life, and you did that superbly. HaKodesh Baruch Hu, literally the most blessed and holy one, God, has given you a talent. You should think about using it more often for the good of others. Was he reading my mind? Well, I'll think about it, I said. Are you coming back to Detroit today? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am, I said. Very good. Then you will be our guest for meals this Shabbos, said Rabbi in a tone which meant I had no choice in the matter. My food difficulties were solved. Thank you, Rabbi. I would like to see you, he said. Uh-oh. 
All my problems started the last time Rabbi Kamanovich had asked me to see and asked to see me. What has he got planned for me now? Certainly, Rabbi. I want to especially thank you for what you did for the Rebbitson, said Rabbi Kamanovich. He must mean Dafna. I enjoyed working with her and hoped to be with her a lot more. It was nothing. She was a big help to me, I said simply. Oh, I did not mean Dafna Lachler. Although I thank you for that as well. I meant what you did for Devora Klein, especially after what she did to you. Your actions showed real compassion and a love of your fellow man, Yosha Koyach. May your strength increase. How did Rebbe know about that? That was supposed to be a secret shared only by the police, myself and Daphna. I knew that both Daphna and I had not told anyone, and it was highly doubtful that he had gotten that information from the police. Rebbe is amazing. He knows things. He feels things most people do not. Suddenly it dawned on me that Rabbi Kamanoj had invited me to his house for Shabbos and that Dafna and her family would be there as well. Perhaps I should ask his advice concerning myself and Dafna. His insight would be helpful. Uh, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Yes, Rabbi Shimon, he answered. You know that Dafna Lachler is moving back to Detroit. What a tragedy. Her, her home was blown up, he said. Well, we worked together and we found that we could be very helpful one to the other. I was uncertain as to how to continue. And anyway, she will be needing quite a bit of assistance getting set up in Detroit. And I sort of volunteered to help her. What is it you wish to ask of me? Queried Rebbe. I guess I wanted to know if it was okay helping Daphna Lachler. I don't want to break any yeshiva rules or get anyone into trouble. Rabbi Reb Kabanovitz laughed and said, Reb Shimon, Reb Shimon, you're such a tzaddik. Now that was no one. Me a tzaddik? Rebbe, believe me, I am no tzaddik. No, believe me, you are a tzaddik. You don't even know it, said Rabbi Reb Kabanovitz with conviction. Go help Daphna Le. She needs your assistance right now. And by helping her, you'll be doing a great mitzvah. So it's okay to help her, I ask once again, to be sure. Believe me, it will be good, said Rebbe. What do you mean by that? What will be good? Could you repeat that, Rebbe? I requested. It will be good, said Rav Kamenovitz softly and broke the connection. If Rabbi Kamenovitz said it, you could take it to the bank. That's the end of Murder in the Kola. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, new book coming out, The Kosher Butcher. You'll see it through Amazon. Very good. Bye.